Hey everyone, and welcome to our second uh, week of class. This week we're talking about arguments. So we're going to talk about what is an argument, and we're going to go through some vocabulary and some uh, categories. So we're going to talk about good arguments, bad arguments, persuasive arguments. We're going to introduce some vocabulary to talk about arguments. So premises, conclusions, valid arguments, sound arguments. So that's what we're going to do today. So first things first, uh, arguments are important in philosophy. Uh, there's a quote that I've seen and I don't know where it's from, uh, but the quote is, arguing with a philosopher is a lot like wrestling with a pig in the mud. After a couple of hours, you realize the pig likes it. And the fact is philosophers like arguments because arguments, as philosophers understand them, are important tools for figuring out what's true and what's false, what's right, what's wrong, what's correct, what's incorrect. Because a good argument gives you real reason for believing the conclusion, and a bad argument does not. And so distinguishing good arguments from bad arguments is a very important skill, which we are gonna try to learn. And I'm sure many of you are already very good at it. It's sort of an important part of just life in general, but we're gonna develop some sort of precise tools and uh, concepts that will help us be more effective at distinguishing good and bad arguments, even though we can all already do it most of the time, hopefully. So what is an argument? When we say argument in our day-to-day -day life, a lot of the time what we mean is two people yelling at each other. Like uh, if a couple is arguing, in an Ikea or something, they're probably just sh getting angry at each other, maybe shouting, saying uh, negative things, attacking each other. And sometimes that can be awkward for everyone else around them. But that is not what we're talking about in this class. These are not what we mean when we say arguments. We don't mean two people fighting each other or verbally fighting each other. What we mean when we say arguments are uh, basically series of statements meant to support a conclusion. And so we're going to watch really quickly a Monty Python skit. This is from Monty Python's Flying Circus, which is a TV show. Uh, and we're going to watch this together. And hopefully it clarifies some things. And hopefully we just think it's funny.
All right. So I find that sketch really funny. Uh, if you don't, then I am sorry, but it wasn't too long. So hopefully it wasn't too painful. But I think the sketch helps illustrate some important points about arguments. One, uh, an argument is not abuse, right? In the sketch, he goes to a room, someone yells insults at him. That's the wrong room. He went into the abuse room, which is different than the argument room. Arguments are not abuse. It's not shouting insults at another person. That's not what an argument is. Attacking someone who disagrees with you is not an argument. That's something different. In order to make an argument, you need to give substantive reasons to show that uh, your conclusion is correct or that the other person's claim is incorrect. Substantive reasons, that's the key in an argument. So it's not just uh, attacking someone, it's not just abuse, it's not yelling insults, that's not part of an argument. But an argument's also not just contradiction. Even if you're not shouting abuse, that doesn't mean you've made an argument. An argument's not just contradiction, so it's not just saying no, or no it isn't, every time the other person says something. It, even if the other person is saying something that you know is wrong, saying no it isn't, is not an argument. You've denied what they've said, but you haven't provided any argument that it's wrong. So if you're not giving reasons why something's wrong, then you're not making an argument. You're just saying no. And what we want in philosophy are reasons. We want reasons for believing things or for not believing things. So we want arguments. And we don't want arguments just because it's fun to argue, even though many philosophers and philosophy students do enjoy arguing. An argument's not just a game played for fun. It's not a game to be won or lost. So I saw a YouTube video at one point that said, how to win any argument. No, that's terrible. That is an awful bad view of arguments. Winning any argument shouldn't be an option unless you are right all of the time, which I promise you're not. We're all fallible. We're all wrong sometimes. We're all wrong about some things. No one has completely true beliefs. Everyone's wrong about something. So you shouldn't win every argument because sometimes the point you're arguing for is incorrect. And in those cases, if you won the argument, then the argument went poorly. There were mistakes made. So it's not a game to be won or lost. That's not a healthy way of looking at arguments. And it's not what we're doing in this class or what we do in philosophy in general. What an argument is, I think is summed up pretty well by uh, the main guy in the Monty Python sketch. I think it's Michael Palin is the actor, the guy on the left. The aim of an argument or of a discussion should not be victory, but progress. That's Karl Popper. That's not, sorry, that's the wrong quote. That's not the Monty Python guy. Uh, that's what Karl Popper says an argument is supposed to be. Karl Popper was a philosopher of science in the 20th century. So the point of an argument or of a discussion is not victory, but progress. It's finding out what the truth is. That's what providing an argument is for. It's finding out what the truth is. One of the best results of presenting an argument to someone is that they point out the flaws in that argument. Because if you believed the conclusion based on that argument and that argument turns out to be bad, that's important information for you to know. So we should be glad. I know it's hard. It, we don't just, as humans, we don't react that way. But we should try to react that way. When we find out that we're wrong, that's good. That means we're now in a better position than we were five minutes ago because we're less wrong. We know that that's false. We have fewer false beliefs and more true beliefs now. So we don't want to win arguments. We want to find out whether or not what we believe really is right. And so this is, uh, this is an important point. It's, the point of an argument is not to impress people or to win or to lose. There are no sides, there are no enemies, there are no opponents. Arguments are fundamentally tools for finding out which statements are right and which statements are wrong. If a conclusion has a good argument for it, that's a reason to believe the conclusion. But if someone provides a bad argument for a conclusion, then that's not a good reason to believe the conclusion. So if someone has a really good argument, like you think all the premises are good, We'll talk about what that means later. Uh, but if you think it's a really good argument that you're wrong, that's a good reason to stop believing whatever they just 
argued was wrong. We use arguments to discover what's true and false. And so we have to be able to recognize and respect good arguments when we see them. Uh, because then we can use them to become less wrong. We can be wrong less often. We can have more true beliefs if we are careful about looking for good arguments and believing things once we have good justification, once we have good arguments. When presented with a really good argument, the only rational thing we can do is to accept the conclusion. And so this is the Monty Python quote that I thought was coming up earlier. Uh, the Michael Palin, the guy on the left, says, an argument is a collective series of statements to establish a definite proposition, which there's a little bit of jargon in there, but this basically gets at the right point. An argument is just a series of sentences meant to give justification, give evidence, give a defense of some definite claim about the world, some proposition. So an argument is a series of statements that give reasons to support a conclusion. That's what an argument is. A bad argument gives reasons that don't support the conclusion. A good argument gives reasons that do support the conclusion. So here's an example from the Monty Python video we all watched a few minutes ago. In the video, the guy who I'm pretty sure is Michael Palin, guy on the left, says is they're arguing about whether or not he has paid. And Michael Palin says, aha, well, if I didn't pay, why are you arguing? Got you. John Cleese, the guy on the right, says, no, you haven't. And Michael Palin, or potential Michael Palin, says, yes, I have. If you are arguing, I must have paid. And uh, John Cleese says, not necessarily. I could be arguing in my spare time. So let's lay this out a bit more formally, uh, sort of point by point. First point Michael Palin makes is that you're arguing, where you refers to John Cleese, the other person. He says, you're arguing. And he says, if you're arguing, I must have paid. And hopefully we can see if both of these points are true, if one and two here, as I've, as I've labeled them, if these are both true, then the conclusion, therefore, I must have paid, also has to be true. Right? This, is, this is a very particular form of argument that's called modus ponens. So if you have an if-then claim, like if you're arguing, then I must have paid, uh, if that conditional is the term for that, if that if-then statement is true, and the if side is also true, if he really is arguing, and if he's arguing, then he must have paid. If those are both true, then the then clause, this, the right side of the conditional sentence also has to be true. You're arguing, if you're arguing, I must have paid. Therefore, unavoidably, I must have paid. That's an argument that gives ju a good justification for the conclusion that Michael Palin has already paid. Assuming, that is, that the premises, points one and two here, are both true. If they're both true, then the conclusion must be true. So the conclusion, and this is important vocabulary uh, for the rest of the course, the conclusion here is that he has paid. That's the conclusion he's arguing for. And the statements you're arguing, and if you're arguing I must have paid, are statements that support the conclusion. They give justification for accepting or believing the conclusion. And so arguments are made up of premises and conclusions, or a conclusion. Usually an argument has one conclusion. So a conclusion is the claim that is being argued for. That's the proposition or the claim about the world that the argument is supposed to support. The argument exists to support the conclusion. The premises, which usually there are more than one, but sometimes there's only one. The premises are statements in the argument that are given to support the conclusion. So they are not necessarily defended. Sometimes they are defended. Sometimes you can have premises that then support other premises that then support the conclusion. And you can get sort of more complex arguments like that. Uh, mathematical proofs often take that form. You prove a lemma, and then you use that lemma to prove the theorem. 
So you have these premises, you have axioms, uh, and then you make inferences, you make little mini arguments that sort of together build up to a big argument. So it can get really complex. But in the simplest form, an argument is a series of premises that you don't necessarily argue for. You don't defend or provide justification for the premises. You just sort of state them uh, sort of on the assumption that everyone involved accepts the premises already. Otherwise, why would you use those premises? If, if people didn't accept the premises, if the premises are false, then they can't provide good support for the conclusion. So you start with premises that are hopefully true, and those premises support the conclusion. You use those premises to defend or argue for the conclusion. So back to the example uh, from the Monty Python video, he says, you're arguing. If you're arguing, I must have paid. Therefore, I must have paid. That's the argument he's making here. That's not how he says it. He doesn't say it in this sort of very particular uh, numbered sentence form. But this is, these are the points he makes. Th these are, this is basically the argument he makes. So premises one and two here, or statements one and two here, are the premises. You're arguing, if you're arguing, I must have paid. Those are premises. And therefore, I must have paid is the conclusion. So this is an argument. It has two premises and it has a conclusion. So two questions that we should always ask when given an argument. We always want to ask these two questions. Question one, are the premises true? Are the premises actually correct? Do they really represent the way the world is, as it is? Are the premises true? Because if they're not true, then it's not a good argument. The other question we should ask is, does the conclusion really follow from the premises? Meaning, does the conclusion necessarily uh, follow from the premises? In the sense that if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. That's what it means for the conclusion to follow from the premises. If the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. So we always want to ask these two questions. Are the premises true? And does the conclusion follow from the premises? So another way of phrasing that is, are the premises true? And if the premises are true, does that mean the conclusion must be true? So those two questions will help us figure out whether or not it's a good argument. And we want both answers to be yes. These are two very separate issues. You can have an argument with false premises, but the conclusion really follows from the premises. If the premises were true, then the conclusion would be true. It's just that the premises aren't true. And you can have an argument with true premises, but the conclusion doesn't follow from them at all. The conclusion's a complete non sequitur. It has nothing to do with the premises. So these are separate issues. And answering yes to one question doesn't necessarily mean we answer yes to both questions. But what we want for a good argument is for the answer to both questions to be yes. We want to answer yes to both questions. So here's an example of an argument. Premise one, Richard Nixon was a polar bear. Premise two, all polar bears are blue. Conclusion, therefore, Richard Nixon was blue. That's an argument. I don't think it's an argument anyone has ever seriously tried to make, but it is an argument. Now, but let's ask both questions. Question one, are the premises true? I mean, hopefully we all know enough about polar bears and Richard Nixon to know the answer there is no. Richard Nixon was not a polar bear. He was a human being. So neither premise, the first premise is not true. And polar bears are white. They're not blue. In no sense are polar bears blue. Uh, so. Premise two is false. So both premises are false. Neither premise is true. But does the conclusion follow from the premises? The answer to that is yes. 
Because if Richard Nixon were a polar bear, let's say we just took a polar bear and it was named Richard Nixon. If all polar bears are blue and Richard Nixon is a polar bear, then necessarily Richard Nixon must be blue because he's a polar bear and all polar bears are blue, assuming the premises are true. So if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. If all polar bears were blue and Richard Nixon were a polar bear, then Richard Nixon would have to be blue. So if both premises were true, Richard Nixon would be blue and therefore the conclusion would be true. So in this case, the conclusion really does follow from the premises, but the premises are not true. And that fact, the fact that premises aren't true means we don't have to accept the conclusion. Uh, an argument with false premises does not necessarily have a true conclusion. Even if the conclusion follows from the premises, even if the answer to that second question is yes, if the premises are false, then the conclusion might well be false. It might be true, but the argument doesn't give us any reason to think that it's true. So we should not accept the claim, the conclusion, that Richard Nixon is blue based on this argument because the premises of this argument are false. And in fact, the conclusion is false. Richard Nixon was not blue. He, at no point was he in the blue man group or anything like that. So here's another argument, another example. Richard Nixon and Elvis Presley were once in the same room. That's premise one. Premise two, best friends are sometimes in the same room. That's premise two. Conclusion, therefore, Richard Nixon and Elvis Presley were best friends. So that's an argument. Again, I don't think it's an argument anyone's ever actually made, but it is an argument. So let's ask both questions. First question, are the premises true? Well, first premise says Richard Nixon and Elvis Presley were once in the same room. And as you can tell by looking at this photograph, that's true. Elvis Presley and Richard Nixon were once in the same room. They shook hands and everything. So premise one is true. Let's look at premise two now. Best friends are sometimes in the same room. Well, that's true. Best friends aren't always in the same room. And not all best friends are ever in the same room. Your best friend could be a pen pal. I don't know. But sometimes best friends are in the same room. That happens sometimes. So... Premise two is also true. So both premises are true. So the answer to our first question is yes, both premises are true. Now, second question, does the conclusion follow from the premises? The answer to that is no. Because Richard Nixon and Elvis Presley being best friends does not follow from the fact that they were once in the same room and that best friends are sometimes in the same room. Why? Because often people who aren't best friends are in the same room. You can be in the same room as someone you're not best friends with. That happens all the time, I'm betting. It happens to me all the time. It happens to you all the time. It happens to everyone. Most of the people you're ever in the same room with are not your best friend, probably. So, the fact that best friends are sometimes in the same room and that Richard Nixon and Elvis Presley were once in the same room, that does not guarantee that Richard Nixon and Elvis Presley are best friends. And in fact, they weren't. As far as I know, they only met that one time and I don't think they really liked each other. That's based on my research. So no, they were not best friends. So the premises are true, and, but the conclusion does not follow from the premises. And so the fact that the premises are true does not guarantee that we should accept the argument. It does not guarantee that the argument is good or that the conclusion is true. Because if you have true premises, but the conclusion doesn't follow from those premises, then the conclusion might still be false. And in fact, in this case, the conclusion is false. Richard Nixon and Elvis Presley were not best friends but the premises are both true. So the conclusion's false, but the premises are true. So the conclusion does not follow from the premises. Now, here's another example. 
Premise one, all platypuses are mammals, right? Platypus is a kind of animal, looks like that. It's a very weird thing. It's got a beaver tail and a duck bill, but it basically looks like a beaver uh, or like a sort of rat looking thing. It's got webbed feet uh, and it, it's venomous. It's a weird animal, it's from Australia. So, but it is a mammal. So platypuses are mammals. Uh, so just now we're all on the same page about what platypuses are, hopefully. I don't know if everyone knew that or not, but here we are. So premise one, all platypuses are mammals. Premise two, mammals don't lay eggs. Conclusion, therefore, platypuses don't lay eggs. So let's ask our questions. Are the premises true? Well, premise one, as I said, is true. Platypuses are mammals. Every platypus is a mammal. But premise two is false. Some mammals do lay eggs. The echidna, for example, lays eggs. And the platypus lays eggs. It is an egg-laying mammal, just to add to its list of weird qualities. So premise two is false. So we have one true premise, but one false premise. And the false premise means that we have to answer no. The premises are not true because they're not all true. But let's ask our second question. Does the conclusion follow from the premises? Well, yeah, yes it does. Because if premise two were true, then these premises would mean the conclusion had to be true. Because if platypuses are mammals and mammals don't lay eggs, then platypuses would not lay eggs because they're mammals and mammals don't lay eggs. So they don't lay eggs. That is, uh, that is a conclusion that definitely does follow from these premises. And so the answer is yes. If the premises were true, the conclusion would have to be true. So the conclusion does follow from the premises. But since we have one false premise, that's enough that we should reject the argument. And it's enough that uh, even though the conclusion follows from the premises and one of the premises is true, the conclusion still might be false because we have one bad premise. We have one false premise. And in fact, the conclusion is false. Platypuses do lay eggs. So here's another example. All cows are mammals, right? That's premise one. Premise two is some mammals lay eggs, right? Now the conclusion, therefore, cows lay eggs. All right, so that's our argument. Premise one, all cows are mammals. Premise two, some mammals lay eggs. Therefore, conclusion, cows lay eggs. So let's look at uh, those two questions that we ask for arguments. First question, are the premises true? Well, yeah, all cows are mammals, that's true. A cow is a, just a kind of mammal. So all cows are mammals, so premise one is true. And some mammals lay eggs, as we just discovered, uh, or you, maybe you already know it, but as we know now, all of us, uh, some mammals lay eggs. Echidnas and platypuses are egg-laying mammals. So premise two is true. So all cows are mammals. Some mammals lay eggs. So the premises are true. So the answer to the first question is yes. Both premises are true. Now, second question. Does the conclusion follow from the premises? No. No, it does not. Because the fact that cows are mammals and some mammals lay eggs does not mean that cows are among the egg-laying mammals. Some mammals lay eggs leaves room for other mammals not to lay eggs. And even if the two premises here are true, which they are, cows might be in the non-egg-laying group of mammals rather than the egg-laying group of mammals. And in fact, they are. 
Cows give live birth. They do not lay eggs. So the conclusion does not follow from the premises. Because the fact that some mammals lay eggs doesn't mean that cows, the specific mammals we're looking at, lay eggs. So the conclusion does not follow from the premises. And so we should not accept the conclusion that cows lay eggs based on this argument. Because even though both premises are true, the conclusion might be false because it doesn't follow from the premises. And in fact, the conclusion is false. Cows do not lay eggs, right? So hopefully those examples have sort of helped see how these two different issues can come apart. The premise, whether or not the premises are true versus whether or not the conclusion follows from the premises. Because that, th that distinction is gonna be important because in this class, we're gonna look at whether or not arguments are valid and whether or not they're sound. Those are sort of our two most important categories for describing arguments. So an argument is valid when the conclusion follows from the premises. And for a conclusion to follow from the premises means that if the premises were true, then the conclusion must be true. The truth of the premises guarantees the truth of the conclusion. That's another way to phrase it. Uh, the truth of the premises guarantees the truth of the conclusion. But it does not mean that the premises actually are true. They might be, they might not be. So whether or not the conclusion follows from the premises is separate from whether or not the premises actually are true. So before we look at whether or not the premises are true, uh, or even without looking at whether or not the premises are true, we can gauge whether or not an argument is valid. And we can gauge that by looking at whether or not the conclusion follows from the premises, whether or not uh, the truth of the premises would guarantee the truth of the conclusion. Or another way to phrase it that philosophers like to use is uh, that it's impossible, it, logically impossible, for the premises to be true and the conclusion to be false. So having both the premises true and the conclusion false is logically impossible. That's another way of phrasing a valid argument. It should all, but it all should mean, it should all come out to the same, uh, these sort of different ways of phrasing the definition. If the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. Or the truth of the premises guarantees the truth of the conclusion. Or it's impossible for the premises to be true while the conclusion is false. Those are all different ways of phrasing or of defining what a valid argument is. So valid arguments, since it, the premises don't have to be true, valid arguments might have false premises. And if they have false premises, they might have false conclusions. So that's the fact that an argument's valid does not guarantee that the conclusion is true. The fact that the answer to our second question uh, does the conclusion follow from the premises? The fact that that answer is yes, that doesn't guarantee that the conclusion is true, as we saw in some of the examples we looked at. So valid arguments might have false premises and might have false conclusions, but they cannot have true premises and a false conclusion. So if you have a valid argument and all of the premises are true, then the conclusion cannot be false. The conclusion must be, must be, must be true. If you have a valid argument and the premises are true. So, Richard Nixon was a polar bear. All polar bears are blue. Therefore, Richard Nixon was blue. We, we already went through this example. So if we look at this example, we'll see uh, our answer to our second question does the conclusion follow from the premises, was yes. And so it's logically impossible for the premise one and two to be true without our conclusion, sentence three, also being true. And so the argument is valid. But the conclusion is still false because the premises are false. It's possible for the conclusion to be false if the premises are false. So, 
there's an example of a valid argument that still has a false conclusion. So whether or not an argument is valid depends on the form of the argument. And the reason the Richard Nixon polar bear argument is valid is because it has a valid form. A is a B, we're here A is Richard Nixon and B is polar bear. All Bs are Cs, all polar bears are blue or are blue things. Therefore, A is a C, A is a blue thing, A is blue. This is sort of the schematic uh, form that the Nixon polar bear argument takes. And so that, that form of argument is valid. And as long as you have true premises, the conclusion must be true as long as the argument has that form. So for example, Lassie is a dog, that's premise one. All dogs are animals, that's premise two. Therefore, Lassie is an animal, that's our conclusion. That's a valid argument. And it's the same argument form as the Nixon polar bear argument. Here, A is Lassie, B is dog, and C is animal. But it's the same form. It's just we're plugging in different things for A, B, and C here. Lassie, if anyone doesn't know, is a fictional border collie from old timey movies and TV. Uh, so that's a valid argument form. Other valid forms of argument include modus ponens, uh, which we talked about earlier. If P, then Q. And P, therefore Q. So uh, an instance of modus ponens might be, uh, if you live in Brooklyn, then you live in New York, premise one. You live in Brooklyn, premise two. Therefore, you live in New York, conclusion. Right, that's a valid argument. So we're plugging in certain statements for P and Q here, uh, but it's a valid argument form. So no matter what you plug in for P and Q, as long as you plug the same sentence in for both P's and for both Q's, uh, you'll have a valid argument. Now, whether or not the conclusion is true will depend on whether or not the premises are true. Uh, Another valid form of argument is called modus tollens. I'm not going to quiz you, by the way. You're, you don't have to know the name, the Latin names of these arguments, modus ponens, modus tollens. None of, don't worry about that. Uh, but just sort of so we get a feel for what valid arguments can look like. Uh, here's another argument form, modus tollens. Uh, premise one, if P, then Q. So it's the same first premise as the other one, as modus ponens. So if P, then Q. But now our second premise is not Q. Our second premise is saying that Q is false, that Q is not right. Therefore, conclusion, not P. P is not right. P is not correct. P is false. So if we plug some things in uh, for P and Q, let's stick with the same examples for P and Q. So if you live in Brooklyn, then you live in New York. That's our first premise, because P for this argument is going to be uh, you live in Brooklyn, and Q for this argument is going to be you live in New York. So if you live in Brooklyn, then you live in New York. That's premise one. Premise two is you don't live in New York. Premise two is denying that Q is true. So here, premise two is denying that you live in New York. So premise two is you do not live in New York. Well. Therefore, you do not live in Brooklyn. Because if you live in Brooklyn, then you have to live in New York because Brooklyn is in New York. So if you don't live in New York, that means you ha must not live in Brooklyn. Because if you lived in Brooklyn, you would live in New York. So this is a valid argument form also. If the premises are true, if one and two are, are true, then the conclusion, uh, sentence three, has to be true too. Now the premises might be false. Maybe you do live in New York and so premise two is false. Uh, but the argument will be valid whether or not the premises are true. 
So here are some more examples. Uh, if today is Thursday, then we have class today. Today is Thursday. Therefore, we have class today, right? That's an argument, and it's a valid argument because it has that modus ponens, if P, then Q, P, therefore Q. It has that form. So P is today is Thursday, and Q is we have class today. Now, the premises aren't necessarily true. For example, today is not Thursday. But we still have a class scheduled today. We had, I had office hours. Today is Tuesday as I'm recording this. So on Tuesday, the premise is true. We have a scheduled class today or a scheduled class time. It's office hours. Uh, but the premises are still false. So in a valid argument, true premises guarantee true conclusions. But false premises don't necessarily guarantee false conclusions. You can have false premises with a true conclusion. But if the premises are false, then the argument doesn't give you any good reason to think that the conclusion's true. So if the premises are false, but the argument's valid, we should probably abstain from concluding anything one way or the other about the conclusion. Here's another example. If we had milk, it would be in the fridge. There isn't any milk in the fridge. Therefore, we don't have any milk. Right? That's a valid argument based on uh, the if P then Q, not Q, therefore not P argument form we talked about on the last slide. So maybe the premises are true, maybe the premises are false, but if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true because it's a valid argument. So here are two more quick examples uh, of valid argument forms. Either A or B, not A, therefore B. So that's a valid argument form. Whatever you plug in for A, and whatever you plug in for B, this argument will be valid because it's saying either A or B is true. One of those must be true. That's what premise one says. And premise two says that A is not true. And if one and two, if both those premises are true, then the only, possibi the only possibility is that B is true. So maybe, uh, maybe we say either uh i will work tomorrow or i will sleep in late premise two i'm not going to work tomorrow well if one and two if those two premises are both true then you can conclude i'm gonna sleep in late another there's sort of a classic movie quote that gets referenced sometimes that uh Someone in a movie, in an action movie, says, I came here to kick ass and chew bubble gum, and I'm all out of bubble gum. The implication being that they're going to then kick the bad guy's ass. Uh, that's essentially a sort of implied argument of this form. I'm either going to kick ass or I'm going to chew bubble gum. And I'm not going to chew bubble gum. And the implied conclusion being, therefore, I'm going to kick ass. I have no idea what movie that's from, but I, I've definitely heard it a lot. Maybe you have too, maybe you haven't. Uh, feel free to Google it if you're interested. Here's another argument form. This one's a little more complicated, but it's still valid. So premise one, either A or B. So we have two claims, A and B, and we're saying one of them must be true. Second premise, if A, then C. So we have some third sentence, C. We're saying, if A is true, then C must be true too. Premise three, if B, then C. So now we're saying, if B is true, then C must be true. So premise one says, either A is true or B is true. One of those must be true. Premise two says, if A is true, then C is true. Premise three says, if B is true, then C is true. So therefore, we can safely conclude that C 
Because we know there are two options, A or B. And on either option, C is going to be true. So therefore, C must be true. That's a valid argument for him. So let's look at some specific cases. Uh, maybe you have a crying baby. I don't know your life. Maybe you have a crying baby. Uh, this is loosely based on real events. Baby's crying, and you say either the baby is hungry or it's sleepy. Someone says, well, the baby just ate. So you conclude, all right, the baby isn't hungry. Therefore, we can conclude the baby is sleepy. If you've ruled out everything else, the, the baby's diaper needs to be changed or the baby feels sick or whatever, if you've ruled out all the other options, if the baby's either hungry or sleepy, then if you find out the baby isn't hungry, you can safely conclude that the baby is sleepy because this form of argument is valid. So as long as the two premises are true, the conclusion will be true. If you go through this case and you find out the baby's not sleepy, well, then you, one of your premises must be incorrect. Either the baby is hungry, or there's some third possibility besides the baby being hungry or the baby being sleepy. Because if the conclusion turns out to be false, that means one of your premises had to be false because the argument form is valid. Here's another example from the slightly more complicated one on the last slide. Uh, this is loosely based on something the Dalai Lama said. Dalai Lama, uh, the current Dalai Lama, the 14th Dalai Lama. Enzin Gyatso, or whatever his uh, real name is. Uh, he said this, or uh, something to this effect. This is what I'm basing this on. So either a problem is fixable, or the problem is not fixable. Right? The those are the two possibilities for every problem. Either it is fixable or it isn't fixable. If the problem is fixable, then there's no point in worrying because you can fix it. So why worry about it? If the problem isn't fixable, then there's no point in worrying. So if it isn't fixable, then there's nothing you can do about it. So there's no reason to worry. Worrying won't help because it's not fixable. There's nothing you can do. So you should stop worrying about it and just move on. Therefore, there's no point in worrying. There's never any point in worrying. So the Dalai Lama uses this argument, it says either the problem's fixable or it isn't fixable. If it's fixable, then you shouldn't worry. If it isn't fixable, then you shouldn't worry. So either way, you shouldn't worry. So there's no point in worrying. No matter what the problem is, there's no point in worrying about the problem. That's the argument the Dalai Lama made, roughly, uh, put into this sort of premise conclusion form here. Now, the argument is valid. If premises one, two, and three here are all true, then the conclusion must be true. So if you think the conclusion is false, then you need to reject one of the premises. One of the premises must also be false because if all three premises are true, then the conclusion must also be true because it's valid. And like I said, this is paraphrased from a Dalai Lama quote. Now, knowing that an argument is valid doesn't tell you that the premises are true. Right, so we've looked at valid arguments, we've looked at some valid argument forms, we've talked about what it means for the conclusion to follow from the premises. So if you know an argument is valid, if an argument is of this valid form, or if you otherwise can tell that it's valid, then you just know that if the premises are all true, then the conclusion must be true. So the argument being valid doesn't mean that it has true premises. So if the argument's valid and its conclusion is false, if the conclusion's obviously false, like that Richard Nixon was blue or that cows lay eggs, then one of the premises must be false, assuming the argument's valid. The job is then to figure out which of the premises is false. If you know the conclusion's false and the argument's valid, then you need to figure out which of the premises is false. So back to the Monty Python, Example, Michael Palin, guy on the left, says, you're arguing. If you're arguing, I must have paid. Therefore, I must have paid. That's his argument. John Cleese, guy on the right, 
has a counter argument, disagrees. He says, not necessarily. I could be arguing in my spare time. So he maintains that Michael Palin did not pay. He rejects the conclusion. And so he needs to reject one of these premises because the argument is valid. And so he rejects premise two. If you're arguing, I must have paid. He says, not necessarily. Premise two is not necessarily true. He could be arguing in his spare time. And that means, if so, premise two is false. And so he rejects the conclusion. And in order to reject the conclusion, he rejects one of the premises. So he tries to undermine premise two to avoid accepting the conclusion. Now, he's just trying to weasel out of it. Obviously, Michael Palin did pay. Uh, so that's not the best, uh, most sort of ethical use of the strategy here. But that's what he's doing. He's been presented with a valid argument, rejects the conclusion. So he figures out which premise to reject, and then he rejects it. Now, so we've said a valid argument's not enough. You might have a false conclusion, even if the argument's valid. So what we really want are sound arguments. And a sound argument is an argument that is valid and has true premises. So if an argument is valid and its premises are true, then the argument is sound. That's what it means for an argument to be sound. Valid and the premises are true. So sound arguments always have true conclusions because the premises are true and the argument's valid, meaning that if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. So put those together, true conclusion. You get a true conclusion every time. So if you think an argument is sound, if you think the premises are true, and that the argument's valid, then you must accept the conclusion because sound arguments always have true conclusions. So if you've got a sound argument, you should accept the conclusion every time. So here's an example of an argument. George Washington was a US president. That's true. All US presidents are politicians. That's probably true. Therefore, George Washington was a politician. And that's a sound argument. The premises are true. All U.S. presidents are politicians, at least while they're president. They, don't, they weren't necessarily born politicians, but while you're president, you are a politician because you are in politics. So all U.S. presidents are politicians. So George Washington was a politician because he was U.S. president. So the, pre the, the premises are true. The argument is valid. Therefore, the argument is sound. So that's what it means for the argument to be sound, is that the premises are true and the argument is valid. So in philosophy, our goal is always to find sound arguments for conclusions. Once you've got a sound argument, you know that the conclusion must be true. However, and this is a very minor point, uh, not all sound arguments are good arguments. So here's a sound argument. One, the earth is round. Conclusion, therefore the earth is round. That's a terrible sound argument. That's what we call a circular argument. But it is sound because the premise is true and the argument is valid. Because the argument's valid because the premise and conclusion are the same thing. It, they're both just the earth is round. So it's impossible for the earth is round to be true and the earth is round to be false. It can't be both. It can't be both round and not round. Either they're both true or they're both false. The premise and the conclusion. So the argument is sound. It has a true premise. The earth really is round. And it's valid. But it's still not a good argument. Like we should look at it and be able to see immediately that that's a bad argument. Why is it a bad argument? Well, it's a bad argument because it begs the question. The conclusion is already one of the premises, which means the argument isn't persuasive in the following sense of persuasive. And this will be on a unit assignment. So just uh, it's important to get clear on this. Uh, 
when we use the word persuasive in this course, what we mean is that someone could accept the premises of the argument before they've accepted the conclusion, without already accepting the conclusion. That's what it means for an argument to be persuasive, because it means that someone could at least in theory be persuaded by the argument. So it's possible for someone who hasn't already accepted the conclusion to accept the premises. And then, on the basis of accepting the premises of the argument, then be led by the argument to accept the conclusion. So that's what persuasive means in this course. It's possible that someone could accept all of the premises of the argument without already accepting the conclusion. So if an argument is not persuasive, that means the only people who would accept the premise are people who have already accepted the conclusion. And if they've already accepted the conclusion, then they don't need the argument. So the argument can't persuade anybody because the only people who would accept the premises, the starting point of the argument, have already accepted the conclusion. So what we want in philosophy are not just sound arguments. We want persuasive sound arguments. We want sound arguments such that you could, at least in principle, accept the premises of the argument without already having accepted the conclusion. So for an argument to be persuasive, we need to be able to accept the premises without already accepting the conclusion. Because if we don't believe the premises are true, if we don't accept the premises as true, then the argument won't persuade us to accept the conclusion. So here are two arguments taken from Jim Pryor's website, which is the reading for this week. Premise one, either God exists or two plus two equals five. Premise two, two plus two does not equal five. Therefore, God exists. That's one argument. Here's another argument. Either God does not exist or two plus two equals five. That's premise one. Premise two, two plus two does not equal five. Conclusion, therefore, God does not exist. Now, if we look at these two arguments, uh, it should be pretty clear that the arguments are valid. This is one of the valid argument forms we talked about earlier in this video. Either God exists or two plus two equals five, two plus two does not equal five, therefore God exists. So that argument is valid, as is the one on the right. Both of these arguments are valid. They're of the same form. And premise two, that two plus two does not equal five, is true. Two plus two does not equal five. So the second premise of both arguments, totally true. Now, Premise one of each argument. Uh, if God exists, then premise one is true. Because either God exists or two plus two equals five, and God exists, that means the either or statement is true. Well, all it takes for an or statement, like either God exists or two plus two equals five, all it takes for that to be true is that one of those two things on either side of the or, one of them is true. Like if I say I'm going to sleep in tomorrow or I'm going to get up early and run tomorrow, uh, I'm right as long as one of those two things happens. What I said is true as long as one of them happens. So if God exists, then premise one on the left side argument here is true. If God does not exist, then premise one on the right side argument here is true. And either God exists or God doesn't exist. Like those are the two options. So one of these arguments is sound because they're both valid. And one of them has all true conclusions. Because either God exists or God doesn't exist. One or the other. Who's to say which one? But one of them is sound and one of them is not. So both these arguments are valid and one of them is sound. We may not know which one. We may, we may disagree about which one is sound. But neither argument is persuasive. Neither argument could be used, even in principle, 
to convince someone that God exists or to convince someone that God does not exist. Because you don't have any reason to accept either God exists or 2 plus 2 equals 5 unless you already accept that God exists. But that's the conclusion of the argument. So even if the argument is sound, it isn't persuasive. The only people who believe that all the the premises are true are people who already believe that the conclusion is true. And so the argument can't persuade anybody. So you have no reason to believe the premises, or at least not to believe all of the premises, unless you already believe the conclusion. And that's true for both of those arguments. So what we're looking for here in philosophy are persuasive sound arguments. We want arguments that are valid, we want arguments that have true premises, and we want arguments that have premises that we accept or that at least could be accepted without already accepting the conclusion. So, those are the kinds of arguments we're looking for. That's sort of the holy grail here. And when we critique arguments in the course of this class, uh, we're gonna critique them based on failing one of these. Either the argument's not valid, so the conclusion doesn't follow from the premises, or premises aren't true, one of the premises might be false, or the argument's circular, and you can't accept the premises without already accepting the conclusion, and so the argument's not persuasive. So those are the sort of goals, those are the ideal arguments that we're looking for. Uh, but... Uh, not all arguments live up to this standard. So we'll talk about this more as we go through the course and learn more material and look at more arguments. Uh, so that's all I have for this video. If you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, I'll be available in office hours next week, Tuesday, 9.05 a.m. to 10.20 a.m. And I'm always available by email. So if you have any questions, if any of this was not clear to you, please let me know uh, and I will do my best to help you.